Hey everyone. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be talking about OCR and post-processing in practice um, and how to actually apply those um, in your own work. Okay, um, so I want to start by talking about off-the-shelf OCR softwares. Um, and so there are a variety of OCR engines that you could use off the shelf. Um, there's Tesseract, which is open source, and Easy OCR, which is open source, uh, but geared towards OCR in the wild that we talked about last time. So like OCR of text contained in natural images. Um, there's also a variety of proprietary um, OCR engines. There's Google Cloud Vision, um, Abby Fine Reader, Amazon Textract. I'm sure there's other proprietary ones, but those are essentially uh, the best known. I think that um, you know Tesseract is a good place to start unless you're working with natural images, in which case um, it makes sense to try Easy OCR. Um, you know the proprietary solutions aren't that expensive um, if you don't have too many documents to process, and so they can also be a place to consider. Um, and so really um, the advantage of using an open source solution like Tesseract is not just that it's free, although that's very useful, um, but also that you can understand what it's doing because it's open source. Um, whereas if you're using a proprietary solution, you know, their documentation is incredibly thin. You really have no idea what it's doing under the hood. So if something goes wrong, um, it's going to be difficult to troubleshoot because you don't know what they're actually doing. Um, and so that's kind of another uh, advantage to working with an open source engine. Um, if you want to work with not OCR on natural images, easy OCR is likely to be the clear winner um, and it will perform much better than Tesseract. On the other hand, if you have documents, Tesseract is going to be much faster and more accurate than easy OCR. Um, we found relatively high performance from Google Cloud Vision and accuracy tests. And this is going to be, I think, particularly true um, for sort of for less supported languages. Um, but the problem is that there's no way to know what it's doing. And so um, it can be difficult to troubleshoot. And if you want to really do things, you know, at scale. So we're talking about, you know, like, you know, hundreds of thousands, tens of millions of you know, document images, then you're going to have like a problem uh, cost wise. Um, another thing that I want to note is that OCR is likely to change a lot over the coming few years. And so we saw last class that sort of the state of the art architecture combines a CNN with an LSTM um, and the CTC loss. Um, but there's an architecture that we'll see called the transformer that has sort of completely revolutionized NLP in recent years and people tend not to really use like LSTM so much anymore. Um, but that hasn't been adopted in any sort of way that kind of generally works into OCR just because I think there, there is a lot of, you know, a lot of work to getting the details right and it's likely to be super expensive to pre train and essentially like that technology just is not there, um, but it could be there. And once there is a transformer based OCR that just works, it's likely to be more powerful and definitely like a lot faster. Um, and so I would just say to, to watch for that, that this is a, an area where the technology is sort of is rapidly evolving and um, hopefully in a way that will make your life a lot easier. Okay. And so if you are going to use an off-the-shelf OCR solution, it's very important to be aware that complex layouts are going to confuse OCR. Um, characters are more likely to miss OCR when layouts are even mildly complex. Um, and complex layouts make OCR significantly more likely to fail to detect characters um, at all. Um, and so, you know, before it can output a character, it has to know that a character's there. And if the layouts look different than what it was trained on, which is, you know, mostly single column books, then it's gonna have a hard time even realizing that there's characters there to OCR in the first place. Um, converting document layouts to more standard formats can substantially improve OCR results um, for what otherwise might be unusable outputs. Um, and so in this, essentially the aim is to rearrange documents to mimic the documents that the OCR engine was trained on, which are kind of overwhelmingly dense kind of single column text that look like a, a standard book. 
And so let me give an example of this to kind of fix ideas. And so this is a publication where the layout isn't really that complex. Um, this has biographies. If you want the layout to be like in English, just rotate it 90 degrees. But the fact that it's in Japanese isn't really the issue here. Um, but you can see here that it has three types of regions, which are the three colors of boxes, which are like an individual's name, a title, and their biography. And even this kind of relatively clean layout just really confuses the OCR engine. Um, and um, so what we did was to think about how we can kind of restack these different types of blocks to create something that mimics what Google Cloud Vision was trained on. And so the bio blocks, which are the, the um, uh, blue blocks there with a lot of text, um, can just be appended uh, until we reach the maximum image size that the OCR engine accepts. Um, the name blocks consist of a single column of characters, and so we can essentially just stack those. Um, those are the red ones. And finally, the position blocks, which are in black, um, consist of multiple rows of characters. And often the final row is like partly empty because the, it only spans, you know, it doesn't span the full line or the final column um, is partly empty. Um, I have to kind of transpose this for it being in Japanese, but it's essentially the same idea if it was in English. Um, and so that, that final row of the person's uh, title description is usually partially empty. And even that alone will like really confuse uh, the OCR engine. And so we take those um, title blocks, segment them into the individual columns, and then restack. And so this shows what we do kind of graphically. The biography blocks, you know, are pretty clean, dense text. And so we're just going to stack those to get to the maximum image size. We want to get to the maximum image size because you have to pay to OCR per image. Um, the name blocks. Um, we stack those um, vertically for multiple images. And finally, the position blocks, we segment those into individual columns. And then we stack them such that kind of each um, column is completely full. Essentially, there's not any kind of superfluous um, sort of white space on the page, um, which can confuse the OCR engine. Um, and so this can definitely feel like a bit hacky um, and can take some experimentation, um, but when it works, it can potentially like salvage a project where you won't bring any usable outputs. So and with this technique, you can. Um, you know, sometimes the OCR is just going to be highly unstable to what you do, which is indicative that the OCR engine is just underexposed to similar documents or fonts and training and may not be usable. Uh, but in other cases, rearranging is all that you need uh, for a good OCR. And so uh, we created an open source tool that makes it really easy to rearrange document layouts for OCR, uh, which is part of a broader package that I'll talk about um, in a few minutes. Okay, um, so that's kind of the broad overview of the off the shelf. I wanted to say a word about easy OCR. This is a package that was just released in 2020, it's open source um, and it's designed to do OCR on natural images. You can use it on a document, but you probably wouldn't want to do that um, because it's just a lot slower and actually not as accurate as Tesseract. Um, and so you see in the middle there, um, there's the ResNet plus LSTM plus CTC component. Um, and because this is an open source package, like even if you don't want to OCR natural images, um, you should be able to take out that code and build your own um, engine on it. Like I haven't personally tried doing that, um, but um, you know, I think that the, the, this OCR engine works pretty well. Um, and I'd imagine that they kind of did a good job of coding that up. And so that could be kind of a place to start for building your own image. But let me talk a little bit through this. You know, you feed in an image, it does some kind of pre-processing to it, maybe making it a constant size and things like that. Um, and then it sends it to craft, um, which is essentially a simplified object detection framework that's just trying to draw boxes where there's text. And so you can think of this as kind of like mask our CNN, but it's lighter weight um, and it, because it's an easier problem. It's just trying to um, detect places in the image you fed it where there's actually text because remember you're like feeding this natural images. Then you're gonna do some more processing like OCR engines binarize things um, and I don't know exactly what it does but there's more processing. 
then it feeds into the main kind of ResNet LSTM CTC. Um, it does some kind of post-processing probably to get it into some standard format and then you have your output. Um, and so again, this is gonna be, I think like very helpful if you have natural images, uh, but even if you don't, if you get into kind of a situation where you're thinking about doing your own OCR, you might wanna have a look at this code. Okay, so now I also wanna talk a little bit about Tesseract. And so Tesseract is essentially like, I think it was one of the first OCR software it's, uh, that exists that was uh, developed by Hewlett Packard all the way back in the 1980s. Um, and, um, you know, obviously in the 1980s and 1990s, this was not using like um, deep learning. It was using kind of traditional rule based methods for OCR, you know, which we're not going to really uh, talk about in this class. Um, but um, I think in something like 2006, um, HP decides to open source it um, and it has been maintained by Google. Um, and um, there's different kind of versions of it. Since version four, it has switched to using a mostly deep architecture that's based on LSTMs. And so like obviously don't use <laughs> legacy Tesseract um, because it's not going to work as well as the deep learning based one. Um, and um, so specifically the LSTMs are integrated as a neural network subsystem that does line recognition. Um, so that's to say that one part of Tesseract handles layout analysis so as to identify single text line regions within a large document. And then another part of Tesseract has an LSTM network used to recognize the content um, of these lines. Um, Okay, um, and um, so it uses um, a language called BSGL um, in order to um, write the code. Um, and again, we're not gonna be able to go into details of how this works. I can't even say that, that I really understand <laughs> what it's doing, um, but definitely um, check out the documentation if you're interested. One thing to also be aware of is because it's this like, um, you know, really old product that originated in the 80s, I get the impression that in some places it's using some kind of like legacy language to refer to things. And so you might see terms that are like a little bit unusual, but I think like um, if you're willing to put some time into it, it's possible to get a deeper understanding sort of of what it's doing. Um, and, um, so this is showing a, uh, a, a model that they have here in Tesseract um, B4 for kind of exactly what it's doing. And so you can see it's feeding this into like a CNN and then you have your LSTM components there in the middle. Um, and then, you know, it's giving you your sequence um, and um, using that to kind of line up with, um, to, to produce a ground truth along the lines of what we saw last lecture. Um, it's also possible to fine tune and customize Tesseract. Like again, I haven't um, tried that personally, but it, it could be worth looking into. Okay. Um, are there any questions about using off the shelf OCR? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna say a quick word about customized OCR. Um, and so, you could obviously also customize your own OCR engine. In the context in which this is gonna be the most straightforward and which I think also oftentimes offers the high returns is to make a number detector. Um, and so I think the customizing your entire own OCR engine could be um, potentially pretty involved, but if you're detecting numbers, um, you know, kind of at the end of the day, there's like 10 digits and maybe some kind of ancillary characters like, you know, a dollar sign or a percentage or commas, periods. Um, but there's not kind of that much there to recognize, which just means less to label and just also can make it faster. Um, you know, I think where it gets particularly kind of complicated to say you want to customize your own OCR engine for Chinese, um, then there's a very large character set and it's a really, um, it can be a pretty challenging problem. But like numbers on the other hand, I think are um, pretty uh, doable with a 
reasonable investment. Um, and so as we saw last class, um, the, currently the architecture that's been the best developed um, is CNN plus RNN plus CTC. Um, and again, you'll kind of find other architectures and code bases out there. And like, they tend to not really work that well, <laughs> just in terms of, you know, is the code base functional? Does it run in a reasonable amount of time? Does it actually give you better results? And so kind of at least as of the current state of the literature, kind of using the CNN plus LSTM plus CTC seems to be kind of like the way to go. Um, and you're going to need labeled samples. This is a supervised problem. Um, and those labels are gonna need to look like the document that you want to OCR. Um, you know, with like domain shift, like if you kind of train something on a modern PDF and then you go to do some historical document, it's kind of amazing. Like it's just, um, you know, AI is a long ways from mimicking humans. <laughs> it's it's gonna work on what it's trained on. And it might look like a small difference to you, but it's not gonna be more than a small difference to the model. Um, and um, so this framework is gonna struggle with complex layouts. Um, and um, so you'd wanna use like say mask or CNN first to identify layout elements that are numbers and then feed those into your detector rather than feeding some sort of more complex table into your detector. Um, you know, and you could potentially integrate that, um, you know, kind of into an end-to-end -end architecture, but you need some sort of like, you know, just like, um, in easy OCR, they had this craft thing. Um, you need some sort of mask CNN or YOLO or like um, a framework that can um, figure out where the numbers are that you want to OCR. And so this is an example of a customized OCR engine that we did. Um, and so these are Japanese firm level reports. Um, and the numbers are circled in blue. I mean, so these are like Chinese numbers, but it's kind of the same principle um, as English in that there are um, digits and um, or as Arabic numerals, right? Um, and um, so these numbers actually use a very flat font. Um, and even though it's like trivial for a human to read these, they don't really, look, you know, um, unless you think about it, um, noticeably different than kind of any other number. Like when you feed this or when you feed them into Google Cloud Vision or Tesseract, it can't even like recognize that there's text there um, because this, this font is just, it's flatter than a modern font. Um, and this oftentimes kind of happens with like historical documents, just like the aspect ratios or whatever of the font change. And you might not even really like notice, but the OCR engine is clearly kind of underexposed to a diversity of fonts and training. And so it just cannot kind of make that leap um, to recognize that there's anything there. Um, and so what we did was to use mask our CNN to detect, to segment out the numbers. Um, and so you can see here um, on the image, like the green is like text and those blue um, are numbers and we segment those out. Um, and then we send them to our own detector, um, which is, again is kind of like we covered in class last time. Um, and um, so you have an input image, you feed it through a CNN, um, and then you um, subsequently feed it to this RNN and that will predict numbers. You know, if you wanted to, you could probably integrate this with mask our CNN and just save yourself a little bit of compute by doing it end to end. Um, but that's kind of essentially, um, essentially the idea. Um, and as always, a major challenge um, is how to create label data at a cost that, that is reasonable. Um, and um, so uh, we started with the closest font that we could find, which was essentially like a flattened Chinese font, um, but really with any font, modern font you could find in a word processor, it's still not quite flat enough. And so we flattened it further. We added some random background noise, text skewing and blurring using the library for text generation that's mentioned here. Um, in the future, I'd probably use a generative model to do this, but we just did this like a year ago before we really had learned about that. Um, we also needed to label actual samples from the documents and also train with those because the generated data just, it's actually very difficult like to fully mimic um, your actual documents. Um, 
But obviously, to the extent that you can do that, um, training becomes a lot cheaper because you're not sitting there labeling um, large um, numbers of numbers. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, in short, we took kind of these numbers and you can see we don't segment out the individual digits, but we segment out the individual numbers, feed those um, into the um, uh, CNN, RNN, CTC model. And that gives us out kind of a much, much, you know, a pretty accurate detection of those numbers. And I think just like, you know, in our applications, oftentimes we like really care a lot about the numbers. And so, um, you know, you can almost certainly do better tuning a model to your own application than like whatever the general model that Tesseract or Google Cloud Vision um, has for detecting numbers. And so if you're finding that the numbers are like problematic, it's definitely worth thinking about like doing your own number detector. Um, and as I said, like an entire OCR engine could be kind of a bit more involved, but it's sort of the same principle. Like you kind of, you need to be able to, to, to um, produce enough data to be able to train it. And if, yeah, if you're using languages with large character sets, that would introduce an additional wrinkle. Okay. Okay, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how we kind of put this together. So we've talked now about doing the layout analysis. We've talked about OCR. Um, and um, I want to talk in particular about an open source package. And so one of my former pre-docs, um, Zhejiang Shen, worked on integrating the models and tools that we developed into an open source package that's called Layout Parser, which you can find at the you know, GitHub link there or just Google it. Um, and so the aim is to streamline the use of deep learning and document image analysis pipeline. So essentially to make it easier for people to use deep learning to go from document images to structured text. Um, the goal is to provide interfaces that are simple and intuitive um, for layout detection, character recognition, and other document processing tasks. Um, like we're also working on building a community platform for sharing both pre-trained -train models and full digitization pipelines. Um, so the, that's not up yet, um, but I think that right now there's oftentimes really no place to share um, kind of what your pipeline is, which means that a lot of research teams end up unnecessarily needing to reinvent the wheel. Um, and we described the package in a paper uh, that will be released soon, along with a major update. Um, and so essentially we can't like release the paper until like the conference makes a decision on it because there's these like pre-publication embargoes. Um, uh, but um, we, we do have a paper that will be released sometime soon that describes the package. And so basically the motivation is that implementing um, pipelines for document image analysis completely from scratch requires substantial expertise um, and programming experience. And currently there is no full-fledged infrastructure um, for curating the targeted um, document image data sets and fine tuning or retraining layout analysis models. And it's also difficult for research teams to learn about how other people have implemented their document image analysis, which is just leads to unnecessary replication of effort. Um, and so layout parser has several components. Um, so there's an off the shelf toolkit for applying deep learning models for layout detection, character recognition and other tasks. Um, a repository of pre-trained uh, deep learning models uh, that underlies the off the shelf usage. Um, tools for efficient document image data annotation and model tuning to support different levels of customization. Um, and then the model hub. Um, and the library is implemented just with um, Python APIs. And so this is kind of a visual description. Um, and um, so you can take document images and run them through layout detection models to get the structure. Um, we will also be integrating um, our efficient data annotation tool um, to make it easier to do customized model training. Um, 
once you have um, layout uh, data structure, you can do OCR or you can, and you can also do storage and visualization. Okay. And um, so for example, if you just wanna use the off the shelf models that are there to perform um, layout detection, you can do that with just four lines of code in Python. And so essentially the layout model takes a document image as an input and generates a list of rectangular boxes for the target content regions. Um, and um, it's going to use frameworks like Faster RCNN or Mask RCNN, depending on which kind of pre-trained model that you called. And so um, this one is calling PubLayNet, which we've talked about before. That's um, a um, layout analysis model that was pre-trained on modern PDF documents. Um, and so this is a list of what it currently supports. Um, so there's PubLayNet, um, that's modern scientific PDFs. Um, and it supports um, like different models. And so the base model is ResNet 50 and the larger model is ResNet 101, um, which may give you more accuracy, but it's gonna have a cost in terms of runtime. Um, and then also, you know, some of these models are pre-trained with faster RCNN, some with mask RCNN. So that's what the F and N detects. Um, Prima is um, a model that was pre-trained on modern magazine um, and scientific reports on kind of a smaller hand labeled data set of these modern magazines. Um, Newspaper Navigator, I mentioned that um, a few minutes ago. Um, and so Newspaper Navigator is a model um, pre trained um, by Ben Lee, who's a CS PhD student, I believe at the University of Washington. And he worked with Library of Congress on their Chronic Clean America data set. And this um, model, he's really geared towards recognizing where the images are in the newspapers because now he's kind of used it to build this tool for Library of Congress called um, Newspaper um, Image Navigator, where you're looking for, it's like a search engine over images. Um, in the Chronicle in America collection of newspapers produced by Library of Congress. Um, there's something called Table Bank, um, which um, one, the, one of my um, collaborators um, did on modern um, tables. Um, so these are tables that come from like, you know, modern scientific articles and business documents. So they're very, very clean, kind of like made with Microsoft Word. Um, and so it's not going to like work <laughs> on any kind of like more idiosyncratic or historical table, but it can still provide a good starting point. Kind of just like, you know, I told you that for our newspapers, which really look nothing like PubLayNet, like starting with the PubLayNet weights still cut the um, training time in half. And so again, like even if you're gonna fine tune these, it helps to start out. Um, and then the HJ data stat was the um, Japanese biographical data that I showed you. Um, and as I said, this is like an open source package. Like as we create more models, we'll add them. And we really hope that, you know, other people will as well. I mean, and so like Ben Lee essentially just emailed us and was like, hey, I can share, you know, I can share my weights. Um, you know, um, if you find the package useful, um, and you fine tune a model that you use kind of for your own paper, um, definitely consider sharing um, those weights. And that can also kind of be helpful to the extent that other people then use those and they share as well. It can create kind of like, you know, so right now this is obviously pretty sparse. <laughs> um, and for most documents, like you're going to have to fine tune your own model, but the hope is that as more people kind of get more engaged in this and you get more weights shared like if you take like historical statistical like census publications for example a lot of them follow like a very similar template um and so there's definitely kind of like um cost to being the person who has to create the label data set as i mentioned like for our newspaper project we've been labeling for like nine months um with several ras and it's definitely but i mean that's a pretty ambitious data set but um there's definitely that cost, but I think like by kind of, um, you know, making those 
public. It just, it's ultimately going to benefit you because then more people can do research in your area and follow up on your work um, and just kind of um, have access to kind of more exciting data in general. Um, so that's the, um, that's the pre-trained models. And as I said, like hopefully this will continue to grow. Um, and so um, the models output uh, layout structures. Um, and so the most common structure is just a rectangle. And so like the layouts are all boxes, um, but the package does also support quadrilaterals. Um, and that can be useful if the image is skewed. I mean, it's kind of to your benefit um, to, to integrate some sort of de-skewing into your pipeline because it's gonna take longer to annotate a quadrilateral than it's gonna take to annotate a rectangle, but it does, it does support that functionality. Um, it doesn't, so you can imagine really weird layouts, um, you know, and um, it, it, it doesn't currently support that, but I think that, you know, for the vast majority of documents, like rectangles or maybe quadrilaterals, if the document's really distorted, work pretty well. Um, and then, um, so those coordinates are associated with a text block, which will also contain information like um, the actual text and the type of text and potentially the reading order, right? So for like documents, that's another important thing to potentially kind of that you could estimate is what, what, what's the reading order of these documents. Um, and then those get combined together into a layout model. Um, and um, so a layout object is a list of all possible layout elements. And it can also include other layout objects, which is useful if you have a hierarchical structure to your document layout analysis, which I'm going to give an example of in a little bit. Um, and all of these different um, objects support the same set of transformations and operation APIs to give uh, maximum flexibility. Okay. Um, and so those operations include things like shift, pad, scale, intersect, union, is in, um, which can be useful when working with document objects. It's pretty common to need to segment the images. Um, and so um, there's full support for image cropping um, and coordinate transformations, um, which is also, um, you know, can be really useful when working with the outputs. Um, and um, a layout class is built that takes in a list of text blocks and that supports processing the elements in batch. Um, and as I said, layouts uh, classes can also be nested to support hierarchical um, layout structures. Okay. And so in terms of OCR, Layout Parser builds a series of wrappers among existing OCR engines and provides nearly the same syntax for using them. And so this is how you would call um, OCR. Um, and so this is setting the OCR agent to Tesseract. Um, Right now, it supports Tesseract and Google Cloud Vision, and you know potentially in the future, um, support can be added for more OCR engines. Um, and it also comes with the model that that I mentioned before that we trained on numbers, Japanese numbers, which is a CNNR and an OCR model. Um, and um, it can you could use it off the shelf if you happen to have a document that looked like that. Um, but you could also take that code and train it on your own customized data sets. And hopefully that would kind of make your life easier than, um, than starting from scratch as we talked about earlier. Okay. And so um, layout parser supports exporting layout data into different formats like JSON, which is probably the most useful um, in CSV. And it supports loading data sets um, in formats like Coco, which um, when you like, um, as we talked about a few classes ago, it, um, uh, Detectron 2 requires your kind of um, your um, labels to be in the Coco format, right? And so um, we support those formats. Um, and it's also built with an integrated API for displaying the layout information along with the original image. And so um, the layout API has two modes. So this is just showing a page um, 
from the paper about this tool and you can see in one um, it's just um, drawing the bounding boxes on the original image and in the second one it's showing you the OCR text which is positioned in the same place on the page as that text and the original image and you could potentially like look at these side by side and it allows you a straightforward way um, to kind of to check the quality to visualize the quality of the OCR and also of the layout detection. Okay, um, and so I think um, right now we haven't integrated it, but in the new, near future, we will integrate a customized version of Label Studio that incorporates the, um, the object level active learning score that we talked about a few lectures ago and other features that it just um, make Label Studio kind of more friendly um, for annotating documents. And so Label Studio is essentially this open source package for labeling. Um, but we, we took the UI and built in these other features like our model score and like, you know, filtering by model score and like opacity to find missing objects and kind of other things that would be useful for documents. And we tried to fix some bugs um, because like most open source packages, it's pretty buggy and you could spend, you know, we spend a lot of time like fiddling around with port numbers and things you need to like make it actually work. And so kind of when we finish trying to, to streamline that code, um, we'll integrate that in. Um, and um, it also provides an API for fine tuning or pre-training a layout analysis model, which is essentially like calling the Tectron 2. Um, and fine tuning on the, the existing models that I mentioned hopefully makes it straightforward um, to apply transfer learning. I mean, another thing that I should say is that it is the case that things like the Tectron 2 get updated like all the time and like, you know, we try to keep it up to date, um, but um, that that's just kind of like an issue to be aware of. Okay. Um, are there any questions about <laughs> anything about the package this far? Um, so again, it's like an open source package and I'm sure that if you like work with it, you'll uh, think of ways to improve that. Um, and if that's kind of something that you have the background to do, we would um, definitely welcome that. It's just like everything in the open source community, it gets better when people want to engage um, and kind of uh, work with it to improve it. And so, um, you know, I'm sure you'll see various places where it can be made better. And um, we definitely um, welcome those, those contributions. Okay, so I wanna talk about a use case. Um, and in some sense, it was like working on these documents that made us develop the tools that we then <laughs> turned into um, layout parser. Um, and so essentially like, you know, it provides a kind of an end-to-end -end solution for working with a very complicated document image like this. And so this image comes from a Japanese firm level report. Um, and there's two kind of levels of hierarchy in the document. And so there's the columns and, you know, because you have to turn this thing 90 degrees to be like you would be used to seeing in English, think about the columns as like a row of a table. Um, so there's columns um, and then there's individual layout tokens, which are like the individual layout elements. And so essentially um, there's um, title columns, address columns, um, text columns and section headers, and then within those four different types of columns. There can be the title itself and the company title, which is like, you know, the type of corporation it is, which comes next to the title, the company name. There's address, uh, text, numbers, um, variables. Um, and um, one really helpful thing about having these two levels is that we have kind of, we did it as two separate layout detection models. And then that means that we, we can check, for example, that you know in the title row, um, the only two types of layout tokens that you should have there are title or company title. And if anything else is there, like something has gone wrong. And that tells you that your model is probably underexposed 
to layouts like the one where it has errors. And if that's happening a lot, that means you need to go label more data because your model's not really uh, working yet, or you need to find some other way to process the image to make it easier for the model to recognize layouts. Um, we use, you know, you could use um, layout parser to rearrange um, the text to achieve better OCR. So they have these complex layouts. Um, Google Cloud Vision hates this. Tesseract would like hate it even more, but you can restack things and that gives kind of much higher accuracy um, than it would be if you just kind of fed in this, this uh, raw image. Um, and layout parser allows you in restacking, again, I didn't put the code here because I don't want to like, I'm not sure it's the best way to present code, but um, you can choose the text orientation um, of fill color, which this came up in a question before. It does need to closely match the background and the maximum allowed height um, of the image, and then it will restack it for you automatically. And so essentially with a few lines of code, you can take your individual layout elements and restack them into something that's going to more closely resemble um, what the OCR engine was trained on. Um, and so, you know, even though we had a relatively small training data set, we can achieve high layout accuracy. The AP score is almost 97 for the columns um, and almost 90 across the um, token um, or individual layout element detection model. Um, we crop images with regions detected as numbers um, and um, send them to our own self-trained OCR model that's based on a CNN and framework, um, which also um, does really well um, and um, really just um, much better. Like, you know, we kind of did this because the off the shelf was just horrible, but I would again encourage you to think about it because if the OCR engine is kind of messing up, you can spend a lot of time fixing it by hand. Like, let's say that you have total columns or total rows, you can check that it adds up and see where there's a mistake and spend a lot of time fixing that by hand, um, which is fine. Um, but you may be able to spend relatively less time kind of designing and training your own OCR engine. Um, and generally, like, it makes your life easier to fix things upstream versus trying to kind of correct them ex post. Okay. Um, and so I want to say something about like, well, we've talked about how you detect the layouts and we've talked about how you OCR them, but that's still not the format you want. Like at the end of the day, you're going to want some data set that maybe you use R or whatever statistical software you happen to use and you want to analyze that. Um, and so how do you get domain, like content domains essentially from you know, this OCR text and these layout elements that you've detected um, with your layout model. Okay. And so um, once individual content regions are recognized, we need to associate the different pieces of content with each other. Um, and this is a context where this is gonna really depend on what you wanna do. There are definitely no, <laughs> Um, single model for associating content because that depends on the structure of your original document. So let's go back to the case of the newspapers, which we've already talked about a few times today. Um, in that case, you know, you have articles that are wrapped into multiple columns and to get the structured data from your newspaper, you need some sort of model to put those together. So in that case, maybe that's a deep learning based sentence completion model to figure out how the different parts of the articles uh, fit should be appended together. Um, and so that's like a case where you would use deep learning. Um, you know, in other cases, you might be able to use simple rules and kind of the bottom line is that you need to design your pipeline um, so that you can extract the desired structured data um, with high accuracy. And so let's go back to the same example of Japanese tables that we've seen here. Um, the um, column title tells us um, which section of the document we're in. Um, and so a title column, which is in black, um, indicates that information is being presented for a new firm. 
and it's going to be followed by a firm's address. And then there's regular text columns, and they contain variable names, which are in pink, and variable values, which are in green for the text and blue for the numbers. Um, and you can see here um, where it says features columns, like that's the domain uh, for the company name that's kind of at the uh, top of that table. Um, there's also these balance sheet columns because um, the tables give the firm's balance sheet, which kind of look like the other columns, except they always have numbers kind of on the bottom and they give in green kind of the, the variable names at the top, but unlike the normal variable names, they're all indented. So they just look a little bit different and you have to take that into consideration. And then there's also the kind of profit table um, at the very bottom there that looks a little bit different. Um, and so how we're going to extract structure kind of goes back to how we define our layout classes. Um, and when you're choosing what layout classes you want to detect, first of all, you need to be able to detect them with high accuracy with whatever your kind of reasonable level of annotation budget is. And the more subtle the distinctions you want to make between different layout classes, the more labeled data that's going to take. Um, and um, you also need to have the information that's going to be required at the end of the day to get the structure out of the document that you want. It's not gonna make sense to try to distinguish classes during the layout analysis where you're only working with the image data, you don't have the OCR yet, that would be straightforward to extract with the text subsequently. Um, and so what determines what a layout element is, um, is typically white space or some other visual feature such as the font that denote the boundaries between different layout elements. Uh, layout elements in different classes should be visually distinguishable because that's what kind of that's what the layout analysis is using it's using the image it doesn't know what the text is yet um, so they should have different fonts um, sizes types boldness um, other distinct visual signatures um, the text is circled and brackets and parentheses um, and the more visually distinct the less labels it's probably going to require in order to have accurate classification. Um, and so here's an example of kind of another um, document that we worked with here. And in this one, we have four classes based on the four layout elements. And I know you guys probably, most of you can't read the Japanese, but that's okay because um, neither, can, <laughs> neither can mask our CNN, right? Um, and so you can see the kind of the bluish is the title of the company and that's easily distinguishable because it's big font and it's bolded. Um, the green is just kind of the regular text, which is a bunch of other information like the address and variable uh, values, etc. cetera. Um, the orange are variable names and those are circled. Um, and then the pink are like um, low, like branches essentially. And those are in those like funny brackets, right? And so there's obviously other things that we need to get this into a data set that Stata or R can read. But um, in terms of what we can hope that the layout model can distinguish, it's those four things because those are the four things that kind of have a distinct visual signature in the document. You know, if you wanted to train it to distinguish individual variable names, you'd have to have much, much, much more training data because those different variable names look pretty similar to each other. Whereas the fact, you know, the title looks pretty different given the different font and like the space around it and the other visual signatures. Um, and so you really need to think what you must distinguish from the visual signature in the image to create a structured database and what you can more easily extract from the text uh, once it's digitized. Um, and so obviously it's really important that we correctly detect and classify the company name region, right? Because if we get, if we say, if we fail to detect the company name or we misclassify the company name and we say like, oh, that's actually text, then everything for that company is gonna be associated with the wrong company. And that's like a catastrophic error. I mean, fortunately one that we can detect, but we really don't want that to happen, right? Um, and how are we gonna figure out what's a company name? 
Well, if you as a human were reading this document, you know what a company name is because it's a big font, it's bold faced and it has a bunch of space around it. The text is not actually that helpful because then like company names can appear in these tables as shareholders or in the company history description or in the name of their banks. And so basically like um, the text doesn't really help us here. We need that visual signature to extract the necessary information from the data set. So obviously we need that to be a class in our layout detection and we need that class detection to be very accurate. Um, whereas, um, you know, if we're just looking for a variable name, um, well, it says the variable name, like as a human reading the table, you know that the first, second and third kind of um, orange boxes are different variables because they have different text. And so that's something that you wanna extract with the text kind of once um, you have the text. Um, obviously you need decent OCR to do this. Um, you're gonna have a, a big problem if your OCR is garbage, um, but that kind of um, just goes uh, without saying, which incidentally is a major headache in this publication because you see how those variables are circled. Like um, Google Cloud Vision hates that and it keeps on detecting them as like images of appliances or you know, heavens knows what kind of like unstable thing. Um, which was a problem. Um, but again, you could do your own custom OCR once you found all those orange boxes, right? Which is another thing to consider when you're doing your layout analysis. Is there something that needs a custom OCR? And if so, can you distinguish that from the visual signature? Because if you can't, then it's gonna be hard to have a custom OCR just for that particular element. Whereas in this document, the numbers look different enough you see in blue that we could detect them with high accuracy and then send them to our custom OCR. Um, there's some room for subtlety in how layout elements are defined. So remember I said usually a layout element is something with a space um, between it. But you can see in the black uh, boxes, which are the titles, um, the, in, inside that there's a red box and that's the name of the company that's big and bolded. And they put big spaces between the like three or four characters or sometimes in the company names, not always on the left, that's not the case, but in the two company names on the right, there's a lot of spaces. Um, and the reason that the model can say, okay, like if I'm in a text region, a space means that it's a different layout element. Whereas if I'm in a title region, they can have spaces between them um, is because the visual signatures are different. Those fonts are bolded. So the model can understand that that's a different like part of the document. So it doesn't always have to be like, well, if there's a space, it's a distinct element. And if there's not a space, it's not. I mean, another thing that, that, that I will say is that kind of like in this document here, the first thing that we tried was just detecting individual rows instead of doing the individual layout elements. And like that did not work well. We just did not have enough information kind of at the end of the day. And um, my, um, my pre doc spent a lot of time trying to you know, make their more most valiant effort to extract what we needed, but ultimately like having those individual layouts was kind of very helpful. So again, you may have to experiment and maybe the first thing you try doesn't work, but um, it, it's definitely you put a lot of thought into this because um, what you detect has a big influence um, downstream. Okay, um, the other thing that I'll note here that's kind of an idiosyncratic detail, but this thing will come up is um, in order to turn this into kind of a structured document, those pink boxes there, those are the variable names in this document. They might be like the assets. Um, the board members, you know, different variables that the company is reporting in these tables. Um, but the problem is they have exactly the same font as the variable values and they're not circled or anything like in the previous publication I showed you. And so the way that you as a human know that is that they are, that um, they're all the way at the top. Whereas if a variable value spans multiple columns, it's indented. So you see that where there's a skip between the pink boxes on the next line, it's indented. Um, but like it was actually Master CNN found that hard to learn. Um, and it would have taken a lot of labeling, um, which would have been annoying. Um, but fortunately, um, actually, this is a very simple and flexible rule. It is always the case um, that the text is indented um, if it's a value 
and it's not indented if a variable name is starting the column. And so we could use that and just use a rule-based method um, in post-processing. And so when we use mask our CNN, these pink and green are the same category, but we extract the pink subsequently by um, looking at the coordinate system. And it happens to be the case, even when the documents are kind of skewed, like as you see there on the bottom, the scan is clean enough that if a character appears in the top box and we define those coordinates in relative terms, which is much better than kind of hard coding the position on the page, if it appears kind of in that top row, it's a variable name. If it doesn't, it's not. Um, and you know, if we had a horrible scan and it was super skewed or something, this you know maybe wouldn't work so well. But it's a clean enough rule that it actually works, and that's how we're able to get those pink boxes. And so I just mentioned that because you know I've said like all the reasons why rules don't work. We actually tried to segment some of these publications by rules first, and again, it turned into this. Um, it's just such a headache because then there were exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions and so on and so forth. Um, and so really like mask our CNN is very powerful, but sometimes there really is like a hard rule and you can use that and then you don't have to do all the labeling that would be required, right? And so there's always kind of a trade off there. And I think you just need to constantly kind of apply critical thinking. Okay, um, another thing is, um, that um, as I mentioned with this document, we have kind of a hierarchical structure where we classify the columns and then we classify the individual elements. And so there's two reasons why this is useful. First, it may be necessary. Um, and so, um, you know, we had a publication where how you wrap the text, you know, when text spans multiple cells of a uh, multiple cells in a table, how do you wrap it? That differed by the section of the table that it was in. So in that case, without having that higher level layout, we wouldn't have known how to uh, append the text together. Um, in this case, it's not necessary per se, but it's very useful um, because we have these two separate layout predictions, but we know, you know, okay, title and company title tokens are the only tokens that should appear in a title row. And so that, and they're estimated independently. And so that allows us to have this ex post signal of how well we're doing. And I think you kind of always want something like that because you can get the mean average precision scores, um, you know, and you will get those um, from running mask or CNN, but you want to kind of practically speaking, um, you know, have an intuitive measure to see how well you're doing. And it wasn't, it's pretty easy to train like a column detector model because the visual signature of the column is just, it's there. Um, and so it wasn't that hard to do. And it gives us this additional check that's super useful. Okay. And so the final thing is, so we have all these elements, how do we actually create the domains? Um, the original documents follow strict rules and we are able to classify the layouts with high accuracy, especially once we remove discrepancies by comparing the column and the token level outputs. Um, and so we can essentially use rules with high accuracy to create the domains. This is not gonna work well if you have lots of errors in the layout um, class predictions or, you know, potentially in the OCR, but it works if you do a good job of that stuff upstream, it works pretty well. And so essentially the structure is always company type, title, company type, address, balance sheet, variables. Um, and um, the company title, type, and address field simply consist of strings. Um, whereas the variables field consists of a list of tuples. So each uh, uh, a three tuple contains the variable key, which is the OCR name, the tag, um, which is um, the corrected variable name, um, uh, corrected for OCR errors, and the values. Um, and the values may themselves be a list. So for example, the board of directors could contain a list of two or five or 20 or 100 names, depending on the size of the firm. Um, and so you can see here why we want to we want to save this as a JSON and not as a CSV, because um, it would be kind of a mess to save this as a CSV. But as a JSON, you have kind of a very natural structure with essentially these nested lists of capturing the structure of the original document. Um, a table domain starts when a company title column appears, and it continues until another company title appears. And variables work similarly you start a variable domain when the variable name appears and you continue with that known domain until another variable appears. And so if there's a hundred names of board members for some giant firm, that's gonna go on for many, many 
um, columns, but if it's a much shorter variable on the next, once you start the next column, there may be another variable name. And tables span multiple rows and it's straightforward to stitch the domains together. Okay. Um, are there any questions about all of this? I know it's like, it's gonna be a little bit idiosyncratic to your use case, but um, I'd say to sum up that you really have to think carefully about what you wanna extract at the end of your pipeline. Make sure you design the pipeline such that you can do that. And you know keep in mind the structures of the documents, the labeling costs, what you can actually reasonably expect to extract with the visual signatures versus with the OCR text. Any questions at all? Okay, I just want to spend like, okay, we're already kind of um, out of time. So feel free to leave if you need to, but I'll just very quickly say a word about, um, we're going to now move to the NLP section of the course. I'm not going to go into um, what's on this table, but I will say I did uh, put an updated version of the syllabus um, on the website that just changed around the topics a little bit based on what people have expressed an interest in with their projects and based on how much that I thought we could cover. Um, and so if it turns out you guys have a ton of questions about NLP, like that is great. Don't hesitate to ask them and we'll kind of adjust the schedule accordingly. So I think there's nothing that like we have to get through and I've added some contingency into this like summarization kind of interesting active area of research. If we have time, great. If not, that's great. But this is kind of, I'll go more into what this involves on Wednesday, but this is where we're going now with the class um, is, um, is into NLP. And I know that a lot of you want to use that for your projects. And so hopefully this will make it easier um, for you guys to get started. And as I said, and especially like as you start working on your projects more, please don't hesitate to kind of um, to, to jump in with um, questions. They're all super good questions. And I'm sure if you have the question, a lot of other people have it too. Um, so, yep, I'll see everyone Wednesday. Thank you.